Well, I'd like to welcome everyone back this morning. My name is Cole Durham. I'm the founding director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. Uh, we're uh, obviously midstream in what I think has already proven to be a very stimulating and interesting uh, conference with, with many contributions coming from many angles. I think this is something uh, that we all know that there are uh, deep and burning issues that many groups are facing, many individuals are facing, and we hope very much that this will uh, be uh, a place where people can come together, can uh, consider the range of relevant ideas, and can think about them from the different kinds of contexts in which these issues arise. Uh, one of the important streams of this conference has been paying attention to media because media is so important in the shaping of uh, what, what happens in our world. Uh, I've been often asked by media friends to give them some sound bites and I have claimed inability to do that and that that's their job. Uh, but we have to uh, think about this and think about what's going on uh, in the media, both the, the traditional media and also social media. Speaking of social media, this session will be on uh, Facebook. Uh, this is a little bit beyond my technical competence, but I understand it's possible for people to submit uh, questions via Facebook. And uh, we'll, when we get to the Q&A session, some of you on Facebook want to send things in, we'll be watching for those and try to int integrate those into the stream of questions. It's my uh, privilege now uh, to introduce Emma Green, who is with us. Uh, she is a staff writer for The Atlantic, where she covers politics, policy, and religion. Uh, she has uh, previously served as the managing editor of that magazine's website, and in 2017, she won the Religion News o Association's Award for Excellence in Religion News Analysis. Any of you who have worked in this field understand the importance of having knowledgeable people writing in the media about these issues. They can do much to f further understanding, and sometimes they can do much to compound polarization, but they can also too much to bring things in the other direction. So without taking further time, let me introduce our speaker now. Thank you. I should just say as a programming note before I get started, if you in the audience are ever asked by an enterprising reporter for a sound bite, I highly encourage you to give it. Uh, the best reporters will ask you for conversations and relationships, not sound bites, but sometimes we're on deadline and uh, we rely on smart people like you to help us to explicate these issues. So speaking of which, what I want to talk about this morning are the issues that I will be following as we move into this coming midterm season and more broadly as we continue in this current era and paradigm under President Trump. Something that I think about often in my work is not just the flash in the news cycle, the latest story, the latest scandal, but the underlying mechanisms that are being used in various parts of government and politics to affect the religious landscape that I am tasked with following. I want to talk about three or four different kinds of mechanisms and some of the technical issues that fall under those. But more deeply, I want to talk about the landscape that those mechanisms are affecting. I think there is some truth to the cliche that has often been tossed around in this era that politics is downstream of culture. And in my field of religion reporting, certainly we see a lot of evidence of that. The shifting opinions on the ground in a church community, 
the way that people are talking among themselves about a particular issue, the fights that are happening internally, often signal what's to come on the political landscape. Those two things talk to one another, the politics and the culture, um, but ultimately my job and my greatest interest is understanding the people and the communities that these mechanisms are affecting uh, and what the era that we're in will, will leave them with at the end. First, before I tell you about these mechanisms and some of these cultural patterns and trends that I've been following, I wanna tell you a story about the place where I've been living for the past year. I have been lucky enough to be stationed in Jerusalem for the Atlantic, reporting on assignment there. And it has been an amazing experience for many reasons, but first and foremost, as a religion reporter, to see a society that in large part is dominated and defined by religion, uh, not just by Judaism, by Islam, by Christianity, by some of the minority faiths that have a presence there, have a claim on the ancient holy sites in the city, has been extraordinary. One of my strongest memories from Jerusalem are the Friday nights uh, when the Jewish Sabbath begins. Uh, there's something that I would always joke sounds a little bit like an ice cream truck that would drive around the neighborhood, and it would play a certain song that was supposed to signal to everyone in their houses that Shabbat was about to begin. There would be certain neighborhoods in Jerusalem where people would put out large stone blocks to block off the streets because you're not supposed to drive a car on Shabbat and little kids would come out with rocks and throw them at people who were seen to be violating the Sabbath. There were also a number of different legislative issues that came up during my time in Jerusalem, both on a local level in the city and also more broadly in the Knesset at the national level, that were about Shabbat, about preserving this holy Sabbath, uh, trying to encourage, for example, grocery stores and malls to shut down. And in fact, there was a successful piece of legislation that passed for areas outside of Tel Aviv that these commercial centers have to shut down on Shabbat, and there was a lot of pushback against that. And similarly, a center that was very close to my house uh, where people could go and get a burger, one of the few places that was open on Shabbat afternoon, uh, was pushed, is being pushed at the moment to close down to respect the Sabbath. To me, this was extraordinary, not only to see that obvious footprint of religion in daily life, but because it underscores the huge differences in frameworks between the United States and Israel, and at the same time underscores some of the similarities and challenges that we're going to talk about today. On the differences side, uh, certainly there is a very different paradigm for understanding the separation of church and state. Uh, there is a big footprint and a lot of influence from the rabbinical courts uh, on the government and the ultra-orthodox groups in Israel have a lot of sway in the coalitional government at the national level and certainly at the local level as well. Similarly, even though the United States is a very religious country and in places like Utah, that footprint is probably felt more than it is in just about any other place, there's a certain kind of cultural dominance of religion uh, in Israel and in Palestine as well that just fundamentally feels different to me. The public and privateness of religion, the balance is different even in secular areas. And finally, in Israel, there are certain aspects of how society functions that to many people in the United States would seem almost appalling in terms of the basic lack of freedom of expression. Um, overwhelmingly, this tends to tilt towards, in the Jewish areas, a more uh, orthodox construction of Judaism. For example, uh, people cannot get married in Israel outside of the context of a religious court or a religious body. And if they don't adhere to or have the certain ethnic characteristics that are necessary to qualify for religious marriage, they have to fly to an island a few hundred miles away or go somewhere in Europe to get married and then come back. Um, so sort of basic lacks of, of freedom that underscore the difference in framework between that society and ours. But I bring all this up not just to tell you about my uh, adventures and uh, talk about nostalgically these moments of experiencing religion in the Jewish state uh, and in the communities, the many communities of other faiths that are in Israel and Palestine, but to underscore how even among these differences, there are signs of the same problems and the same challenges that we see on religious liberty in the United States in Israel as well. 
First, these fights are almost always big grapplings over public and private sphere and who should have control over determining the kind of footprint culturally and religiously in the public sphere. The second is a fundamental fight over the character and identity of the country. And to me, this is one of the most foundational parts of understanding what animates religious freedom fights in the United States. When people are invested in a certain type of religious freedom outcome, sometimes they're just concerned about protecting their own group, building fences and boundaries to make sure that they can practice in the way that they want to. But often there's something deeper there, a claim about who we are as a country, what kinds of values we should have, what kind of place we should be. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the big takeaway for me in that similarity category is that fights within the family are almost always the dirtiest. And I think here in America, we've seen that to be true. And I'll come back to that later. I think that will be ultimately the biggest takeaway from this current political era. Uh, fights within the family are, are often brutal. So I want to go through those mechanisms, uh, underscoring some of those American-specific ways that we see religious liberty changing and shifting in this environment, uh, some of the big footprints that are being laid now that will ultimately lead us um, forward in the next few years. First, obviously, uh, there are the battles that are going on in the courts. And as you all well know, perhaps better than me, because I understand that approximately 80% of the people in the room have a law degree, um, the courts are, are not given to uh, contemporary wins in the sense that courts are slow-moving bodies that function in well, they function well in a dinosaur-like fashion. Um, and so it's not exactly right to say courts in the Trump era are doing X. But we have seen uh, that under this current composition of the court, um, and perhaps for the past few years, there's been a particular interest in taking up issues of religious freedom, and particularly issues of religious pluralism. We've had some bombshell decisions come down just within the last 18 months. Obviously, recently, uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop, which uh, comes from this part of the country, if not this state in particular, um, was an important, if sort of punting or delaying decision. Um, Trinity Lutheran sort of setting the stage for many fights in the future over what it means for states to give money to religious institutions and what that line is between funding an actual religious establishment or religious activity. And then cases that are still to come, ones that maybe don't even specifically reach a First Amendment question having to do with the Establishment Clause, but have that unmistakable flavor of religion. Um, I think of, for example, Nifla v. Vicero, which is coming down imminently, didn't come down this morning, which is great for me because my editors would be getting on me uh, to write about it if it were. Um, that's an example of a case that unmistakably has a religious footprint to it, and the court has expressed uh, a curiosity and an interest in trying to take up these cases, even if ultimately they're ruled in a, in a narrow way. Another mechanism that we're seeing which has changed uh, under the current administration is an approach to executive power. I think one of the takeaways from President Trump's administration uh, is the limitedness of executive power and the impermanence of trying to legislate, as critics would say, of President Obama by pen and phone. We have seen in the past 18 months a wholesale rollback of many of the rules that the Obama administration uh, tried to promulgate and the dear colleague letters that it issued offering its interpretations of different statutes, in particular having to do with gender identity and sexual orientation and the way those apply in current federal law. Uh, the wholesale rollback that has been slow but ultimately a steady drumbeat is a sign that a president trying to get those things done uh, just by dint of executive power is not necessarily going to be making a lasting impact. But the flip side is that, ironically, President Trump has shown himself to have some affinity for pen and phone as well. Uh, as we've seen, there have been a number of stately ceremonies in the Rose Garden, some more ceremonial than others, uh, rolling out executive actions on religious liberty, again, some having more practical weight than others. Uh, 
President Trump pushing forward and his various agencies pushing forward with revisions to interpretations of rules having to do with funding for abortion and birth control. Um, all of these are a sign that perhaps lessons learned about executive power are not lessons learned after all. And watching what kinds of issues the Trump administration and the various agencies of the executive branch take up is something that I am very interested in and watching closely. Under the Trump administration, we've also seen a shift in rhetoric and in bureaucratic attention. And this, I do think, has an effect. Um, I do think that the speech making and the ceremonies, although perhaps short sometimes on practical effects, ultimately have a really strong signaling effect, um, both to a technical legal community, but more broadly to different religious communities on the ground about what the administration is caring about. Um, in particular, just to name one example, uh, within the past week or so, uh, the Justice Department announced a new initiative focused on education surrounding the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, uh, which is a law that's dear and dear to my heart, in part because uh, I'm fortunate enough to have an editor who was willing to walk with me on a big feature piece about local zoning ordinances and religious discrimination, um, something that I wrote last fall. Uh, I think the cases that are brought under RELUPA are often the uh, most under-talked about and least acknowledged front of the religious freedom fight in the United States. Uh, and the fact that the Justice Department is putting resources towards an educational initiative around RELUPA uh, is a sign that they're paying attention to that aspect of the religious freedom landscape. But there is also another aspect of this, a flip side of this, um, going again to that mechanism of executive power, what the effect of the Trump administration has been on the religious freedom landscape. I hear consistent criticism from religious minority groups, uh, in particular Jewish groups, Muslim groups, that under the Trump administration, and in particular in this political environment more broadly, there have been actions taken both explicitly and implicitly that create an environment in which religious freedom isn't possible because safety of body, safety of mind and spirit are not being guaranteed. Uh, there are some overt examples of this. For example, the fight over the Trump administration's travel ban on uh, people immigrating from Muslim-majority countries, whether or not you agree with the interpretation. Many Muslims in the United States believe that this was targeted at their religious community in particular. And then there are more subtle issues that arise, um, harassment, uh, incidents of hate crimes, which are very difficult to track and enumerate, but in general, uh, among these minority communities, there's a perception that this is of increasing urgency and importance, and particularly in environments online, uh, in public spaces. These are the cultural aspects that I was indicating before that are a little bit more difficult to pin down and put a finger on, but that ultimately can have more importance in the long run than some of those technical uh, issues that are coming down from the Oval Office or from an agency building. Finally, there's legislative action. Um, there's been great work that's been done um, by a colleague of mine in the broad sense on the religion beat, Kelsey Dallas, who writes for Deseret News, a hometown girl, um, maybe not hometown to Provo, but uh, hometown to Utah. Uh, she's done wonderful tracking work of local legislation at the state level and at the congressional level, I think there is some attention to this as well. However, we have a largely gridlocked Congress, so from my perspective and my point of view, even though this is an issue that's talked about at the national congressional level, uh, it's not necessarily the area where most action is going to come from in the coming months. All of that is to run through a litany of issues that most of the people in this room probably follow very closely. And I, I offer those only to give you a little bit of a view into my reporter's brain as I'm tracking different issues and thinking about different frameworks. But ultimately, the number one change mechanism thing that I'm tracking is the era of fracture that has come uh, during the Trump administration in this current political climate. I think that the biggest legacy to come from this time, which is perhaps a continuation of forces that were already in motion, is a legacy of division, of internal battling, of internal grappling over identity. And I bring this up because I do think it's, rele it's, it's relevant to religious liberty and to religious freedom. The way that communities define themselves and think about themselves, the issues that they agree upon as being core and fundamental to them, such that they want to advocate for their freedom, 
this, these, are, these are the decisions and the conversations that shape our legal landscape from the ground up. They shape advocacy, they shape legal challenges, and ultimately they shape the cultural mood and the political will that voters have uh, for certain issues to be passed or not passed or supported or not supported. So I wanna ask the question, uh, as we've looked at these mechanisms for religious freedom changing under Trump, who are these mechanisms and changes really for, and what exactly are they actually achieving and preserving uh, on that landscape of cultural change and fracture? There have been many, many examples of infighting among different religious groups and denominations, even in the past week or two of news. Um, for one example, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, reckoning with the correct relationship to political advocacy, there was significant division among the messengers who went to the annual meeting in Dallas over whether it was appropriate to have Vice President Pence speak during what is ultimately a meeting about talking about missions and talking about the future of the organization. And more broadly, that echoes an uncertainty among the ranks of conservative evangelicals about the appropriate posture towards religious advocacy and the role that that plays in their churches and, and their communities more broadly. There have been technical examples of the Southern Baptist Convention as well, struggling over its approach to religious freedom issues. For example, Russell Moore, who is the head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, which is the political arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, was in hot water after Trump was elected, in part because he had been an overt critic of President Trump. Um, but he was also in hot water for some issues that didn't get as much play. Uh, one example was signing on to an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, on a case about mosque building. Um, the ERLC had essentially said, we support the right for this mosque to be built for this Muslim community to build their religious center, in part because the day that they aren't able to build is the day that we're not able to build. And there was significant pushback among the convention, uh, disagreeing that this was the right posture to take, that this was something that was appropriate for the ERLC to be doing. Flipping sides completely, um, the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church of the USA, which is a more liberal mainline Protestant denomination, uh, has just this week voted to approve a new resolution about religious liberty. I'll read it to you. The PCUSA resolves to stand against any invocation of religious freedom, and religious freedom is in quote marks, that deprives people of the civil and human rights to equal protection under the law that uses religious freedom to justify exclusion and discrimination. To me, this is a radically different posture. Uh, it suggests, first of all, uh, implicitly, or maybe less than implicitly, um, LGBT communities and populations, minority religious populations, uh, sort of taking a stand that's more inclusive, thinking about religious freedom as something that should be more inclusive, rather than something that's sort of protecting uh, their denomination from some sort of incursion from the federal government. There have been internal fights among Jewish groups, and particularly between Orthodox and more liberal groups in Judaism. Um, just recently, for example, the Orthodox Union welcomed Attorney General Jeff Sessions to uh, one of its annual meetings. They presented him with a plaque. There was uproar among liberal Jewish groups. They were able to get along enough to put out a statement uh, just this week on the family separations that have been happening at the border, but this is a temporary papering over a long-term and simmering difference over the right approach to advocacy, the right approach to politics, to protest and be in the opposition, or to try to accommodate and be friendly to the administration. We've seen this in the Catholic world. Uh, the, US Cath the US Conference of Catholic Bishops has put out many, many statements uh, protesting the Trump administration's policies on immigration and refugees, including the family separations at the border this week. But among their ranks, it's not so clear that the people in the pews are supporting the clergy who are putting together these statements. We see, even on Fox News, derisive comments about big refugee, the sort of manufacturing of an industry that gains money from the intake of refugees, a, a sort of diminishing of the rationale or the motivation behind those Catholic statements. Um, and that's a, a, a line and a, and a way of thinking that probably many Catholics in the United States are sympathetic to, or at least here on their evening news. 
And we see this as a, as a hometown issue as well um, within the LDS church um, and within the state of Utah. Uh, legislators have been grappling uh, with this issue of pluralism and religious freedom. Um, the LDS church has, legislation has as well, legislators have as well. Um, in some ways, Utah is the only model of a kind of pluralistic experiment in the country in terms of the way that it's dealt with these conflicting claims between religious groups and LGBT populations. Um, but internally as well, within the house of the LDS church, um, there are lots of internal divisions over the legacy of how LGBT persons are treated, uh, racial differences, and so this just shows that even in uh, places where there is a commitment to that kind of pluralistic compromise, there can still be issues that, that carry over and, and create pain. Ultimately, the political, legal, and legislative environments matter. Um, but as I said, politics is downstream of culture. And the legacy of the Trump era is ultimately, in my view, going to be one of breakage. It's going to be one of remapping. Uh, how different demographic groups think about their own religious identity and how that relates to political advocacy and political presence and voice. And it ultimately will probably lead to some sort of formal or informal splitting and fracturing between different groups in different religious communities. This has been a time of pressure cooker as these different mechanisms have been sort of put upon this landscape already fractured in nature. Um, and so I am interested to watch uh, what will happen to these communities as they grapple with their own sense of identities and priorities. I want to end with a quote that illustrates the opposite side of this. I've just talked about fracture, uh, some of the intense hostility and division among different groups, people with different values, claims, and stakes. Um, but I also want to share a quote that to me is a reminder of what happens if the goal becomes the opposite. If we move too far in the direction of papering over differences, not struggling with the pluralistic project that we have uh, tasked ourselves with here in the United States. Um, there's a Protestant philosopher who once wrote that those uh, who try to just uh, go along nicely with interfaith work or who uh, make sort of a, a paper thin commitment to pluralism uh, have a sort of genial confusion in which one tries to enjoy the pleasures of difference without ever committing oneself to a particular vision of resistance and hope. I think that's a good warning because uh, ultimately the United States is a country of particulars. It's a country of deeply held value propositions. It's a country of difference, yes, and diversity. And I think what's so distinctive to me about the United States what has been underscored for me after living in a country that uh, is very different and in some ways very uniform is that uh, the, the greatest character of the United States is that of difference, but difference that comes with struggle and hard boundaries and not easy answers or platitudes. Um, so ultimately, I think, I think we're in the pressure cooker for the long run, perhaps. Um, maybe there will be an easing off on the political side at some point, but we're, we're set with this situation for good. Um, and so I will be watching and tracking what happens uh, as, we, as we see the effects of the, the pressure cooker unfold. I would love to take questions. Uh, if anybody has a question about what I've spoken about or something else entirely, um, feel free to go to one of the mics on either side of the auditorium. Um, and I look forward to hearing uh, some of your thoughts. I can't, I can't see very well from up here, so your only vague body is made out on the side, so you can just, once you have the mic, go ahead and ask your question. All right, thank you. <clears throat> As one who <clears throat> returned just last week from a month in Jerusalem, I'm delighted that at this forum, you, a, a person, a journalist or a media representative, from Israel has been invited to speak, and your observations, I think, were really very much to the point and really excellent. While I was in Jerusalem, I had the honor, really, 
of attending the opening of the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, which was a magnificent event and long overdue, but really delighted to attend it. And it was a tribute to President Trump that finally Jerusalem is being recognized as the capital of Israel. I was appalled when I learned from people in the United States and my family that at the same time as the celebration of the opening of the embassy was being shown on Facebook and other national TV programs, the screen was split and this attack by Hamas on the border, on the Gaza border, was featured together with the celebration and in newspapers that followed the opening of the embassy, the emphasis was placed on what was clearly a planned attack on Israel by Hamas. And I have to ask you, as a representative of the media here, whether you think there is any defense or any justification for what the media did with regard to what happened in Jerusalem on that day. Thank you for your question, which is a difficult one. And certainly, I don't want to speak for the whole of the media, um, in part because the media is diverse and uh, coverage ranged quite a bit. I was also at the opening of the embassy and so tracked some of the stories that came out. Um, what I'll say in brief to try to keep it relevant to this group here um, is that uh, when any big event like that is happening, um, there are a couple of perils and there are a couple of imperatives. Um, so one of the perils that we saw during that event uh, was a lot of parachuting in from either Western Europe or the United States, people who haven't really been on the ground uh, in the country, don't know a lot about the conflict, writing up what seemed to be a very simple uh, story about, on the one side, decadence, on the other side, destruction. Um, so that's one peril. And another peril uh, is not having the, the context and background to understand um, how the media and environment in particular in Israel can be uh, manipulative in the sense that uh, there was intentionality to a certain extent behind the timing of the protests that happened on the Gaza border. Um, and there was also intentionality in trying to create the impression that the protests on the Gaza border were about the U.S. Embassy, uh, which was not exactly correct. So those are the perils. But I will say that there are imperatives as well. Um, and for journalists, it's our job to write as accurately as we can, as truthfully as we can, and with as much context as we can uh, for readers to understand what's going on on the ground. Um, and I do think there was legitimacy to the split screen, uh, not as a direct comparison, but just to understand the difficulty of the situation uh, that was happening more broadly in Israel outside of Jerusalem. Uh, and comparing that to the celebration, which seemed to be uh, unfettered optimism in, in Jerusalem itself. So uh, I think with that in mind, I don't have a clean answer for you. I think at any time, coverage is, is difficult to discern and trying to pick up on the right thread in comparison is difficult. Um, but certainly, I think that is a great case study in underscoring the difficulty of trying to balance different narratives and facts, um, especially in Israel. Another question. and. If you wouldn't mind, keep your question in the form of a question. Hello? Is it on? Oh, good. I, I first want to say thank you for coming. Uh, that was great to listen to you. You articulate well, and it's fun to have someone come. I love BYU, and it's fun to have someone come that thinks about important issues a little bit differently than I do. Uh, the question I have is, uh, I think almost everyone agrees that the United States of America is the greatest country in the history of the world. Um, and I was just wondering, up until 1960s and 70s, an important part of America was some moral laws, things like adultery being against the law. Uh, we legalized abortion in the 1970s, early 70s. Other things like you couldn't get divorced. In the United States, you couldn't get divorced until California passed the no-fault divorce. We had the Bible as part of our high school curriculum. In fact, I'm from Texas, and in Texas we had blue laws, which I think lots of states did, similar to what they have in Jerusalem where it was illegal to open a store on Sunday. So my question is, has the change, the moral change that's happening in America since the 60s and 70s 
Is it good for the country going forward, or is it not good? I appreciate your question in part because you pulled a clever trick out of a journalist book and that you're trying to pin me down into stating my opinion. Um, and now I'm going to pull a clever journalist trick and try to wiggle my way out of giving you my opinion. Uh, in part because although I work for a magazine, so I make arguments, we do analysis, um, I try to stay away from good, bad, yes, no, this person is bad, this person is good, uh, in part because I don't think it's that interesting necessarily what I personally think, um, and also because I think it makes me less able to do my job well. Um, I need to be able to listen to many, many different perspectives and understand those in order for our readers ultimately to understand those. Um, all of that is to say, I think you're right that there has been a total environmental shift uh, in the United States over the past 50, 60, 70 years. Um, I think that the landscape that we're operating in now, you could perhaps, if you wanted to draw a crude metaphor, characterize it as uh, religious liberty or certain types of moral identities in the public sphere being on the defensive rather than being on the offensive in the sense that I think uh, for many, many years, those points of view were dominant in a legal uh, and law context and that uh, in the past 50, 60, 70 years, slowly there's been a peeling back of the dominance of those narratives or the right of those narratives to dominate uh, the public sphere. Um, and I don't know what that will look like, um, how far you peel back the layers before you get to a point uh, where people feel as though they can't express their faith um, or exercise their religious beliefs in public, even in private, in certain contexts. Um, these are the questions that I think are, are burning right now. And I think in part that's why the Supreme Court has been so interested in issues of religious liberty in the past couple of years, um, because we are getting to those nail bed layers of peeling back uh, sort of that public perspective and public legal perspective. So we'll have, we'll have to see where it goes and, and what happens. Can I, can I ask one more or not? Oh, I've been Facebooked. Um, you go first, and then I'll get Facebook. But make your, your question pithy. OK, I'll try to be pithy. So our lupa looks like actually an area of continuity from Obama to Trump in terms of the DOJ emphasizing its enforcement. I was, str I was wondering, when you hear from minority faiths, from Muslims, Jews, and also from racial minority congregations who have been particularly vulnerable to the land use issues, are they concerned that it's not actually being enforced by the DOJ under this administration, or is it more the rhetoric out of tweet worlds that makes them nervous, or even social hostility that is not being reined in by the, maybe the administration? That's a great question, and I think one of the aspects that I smoothed over in my comments, which you have gestured at, um, is the importance of understanding the permanence of the federal bureaucracy. Uh, in reporting my future story on RELUPA um, last fall, I was in contact with a number of DOJ officials who are essentially career attorneys who work on either RELUPA specifically or more broadly on religious freedom issues in housing or whatever uh, context. And I would say, number one, um, in general, my impression of those career civil servants is that they are committed to enforcement of the law consistently over time. Um, that second, we see from the record coming out of DOJ in terms of the cases that it's bringing, the cases that it's resolving, the types of priorities that it's assigning, um, that on these kinds of issues, RELUPA, for example, um, it's still aggressively taking on, for example, mosque cases. This was a big question at the beginning of the Trump era. Would there be sort of a pivot away from enforcement on uh, land use uh, restrictions on Muslim communities because of some sort of animus or bias? And that just hasn't played out. Um, there have been several major settlements that have come down. It seems to be an aggressive priority of, of the DOJ. And so I would just say that I think um, maybe the way we can think about it is icing on the cake or perhaps a difference in signaling of priorities, a difference in the way that it's talked about. 
Um, in large part, the, the machine is going to keep operating, and I do believe that there are people who are really committed to upholding and enforcing the law who are part of that undergirding machine. And the question is just where their attention is directed, what kind of emphasis they take, um, and what kind of rhetoric is coming down from on high to sort of be the framework for what kinds of cases they should be taking up. Okay, I have a Facebook question. Um, the question is, how much is social media contributing to polarization? Hmm. Um, I think this is a difficult question, uh, one I think about a lot because as part of my job, um, perhaps an occupational hazard, I have to spend a lot of time on Twitter, which is a nasty place, and I would suggest that you never go there. Um, Spending time there and sometimes on Facebook, uh, certainly we see the footprint of polarization. I think there has been a lot of wonderful reporting, particularly about Facebook, that shows in concrete ways the way that uh, people have essentially segregated themselves, self-segregated uh, in terms of what they share, what they see. Um, the Facebook algorithm tends to populate stories that people will like, it predicts people will like. So it's created this red universe and this blue universe in you know, sort of gross generalized terms. Um, and so on that basic level, I do think uh, polarization has increased because of social media. But I think more broadly, and the thing that I am more concerned about uh, is the level of hostility that pervades our social discourse. I think this is true on Twitter and on Facebook. I think this is true on uh, television, cable news. I think this is true in our, our public debates, um, public statements. I think there's a level of um, just sort of nastiness that has come to be the accepted norm in how we speak to each other in the United States, in political environments, in the public sphere. Uh, and I think this is particularly of interest for this group because uh, presumably as people who are very attuned to the delicacy of pluralism, um, you appreciate the necessity of good, strong discourse for resolving some of those tensions and uh, sidestepping some of the, the perils of, of trying to live pluralistically. Um, so certainly I think this is a, a really important contextual aspect of what's happening. Um, and in the meantime, all I know to do is keep following it and try to never tweet as much as possible. Do we have one final question? Got to project, but no, let's do it. Okay, here's the microphone. And very quick. The question of how we, uh, how we can disagree without being disagreeable seems to be the core of everything you're presenting. In your observations, where have you seen a forum that can work with such uh, entrenched ideals? Mm. You know, I'm going to give an answer that is going to sound um, so uh, on brand for a religion reporter, and I promise I'm not trying to be a, a walking cliche, but I, I really do think that uh, religious communities and more broadly sort of civil society, the voluntary organizations that people are part of, those um, places where people gather that invite a space for difference, um, where people aren't gathering just because it's a personal interest of theirs or because it's a political belief, but because there's some sort of deeply held value about community and being in community of difference. I think those spaces are so important uh, for adjudicating these questions of pluralism and ultimately so important to follow because they're very fragile. And especially now, more than ever, I think they're, they're very fragile. Um, I think that religious communities have been around forever. And because of this, they've developed a lot of mechanisms for resolving disputes, uh, bringing justice, figuring out how to bring some sort of, of disagreement or hurt to someone else, um, and figuring out the right way to deal with someone who has done something unjust, meeting out punishment. Um, I, you know, I was telling a story last night in the car on the way over here that my favorite story that I've ever written uh, was when I got to sit in the conference of uh, a Mennonite regional group uh, in Pennsylvania as they 
uh, tried to work through a fundamental disagreement over LGBT persons um, and the role of those people in their church communities. And they did everything through Robert Rules of Order, which of course was hilarious in its own way, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but it was just hilarious. It was this very dramatic, high stakes thing, and they had to keep going through motions and asking for, do you nominate, do you nominate, do you? But the, I bring that up because they have a way of doing it. They have a language and a mechanism. Um, so I think that's powerful. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think religious communities are fascinating to report on. Um, and ultimately, I think the health of those communities, the robustness of those communities, and other civil associations like them, voluntary associations like them, is going to be one of the measures of whether we'll be able to move out of this pressure cooker time uh, less than scathed. Thank you all so much.